Um, and yeah, with that, I want to welcome you all to this session, uh, which I call Starting Up. And it'll be a little bit about nonprofits, a little bit about other models that work to help you uh, take money and use it to pay yourself and your people and get some work done. So, um, so here we go. We got about an hour together. And um, gosh, how do I? I don't know why this is not i feel like as soon as i get on recording it's like i can't operate anything anymore so if i say present are you all seeing my screen yes zane is saying yes cool so let's we'll just take it from there um if you if you came here from the main notes document or from the main like conference schedule you'll see there's session notes there and so uh juan pablo can i make you uh, put that note in the chat, put that notes link in the chat so that people can take notes. And then I'm going to get started. So I'm Danielle Robinson. I wrote Code for, Code for Science and Society. I'll have another slide where I introduce myself later and stop talking for the moment. Um, here's what I want to do in this session. I want to talk about different ways that you can incorporate or create an entity with which you can receive money to pay your people to do your project. Um, we're going to start with a little bit of norm setting where I hope we can get to know each other, talk about what's important to us and what we want to learn. I'll intro myself, uh, Zane, who, as I said before, is part of a worker owned cooperative, which is a model that a lot of people in our space are interested in. And then since we have such a nice small group, I thought we could just go around and do quick like 15, 20 second intros. Then I have a slide with some common models that exist in the space today. Um, and Juan Pablo, I'll be really interested to chat with, to ask you some questions about the model that PKP uses. Um, and then I have some questions for discussion. So one of the things that happens, because I run a 501c3 that acts as a fiscal sponsor, people call me when they're trying to get a grant and say, um, you know, what should I do? Should I incorporate a 501c3? Should I continue working as an independent consultant? Should I take this grant to a university? And so I can just offer the questions that I ask people to help them um, frame their decision. So to keep going, um, I first wanna thank you all for spending your very most precious resource with me at uh, 5 p.m. Um, in my time zone, who knows what it is in your time zone. Our most precious resources are our time and attention. And so to make this session productive for everyone, I thought we could talk about some communication norms to set, um, pronouns with in introductions with pronouns, which of course I forgot to do immediately. My pronoun is she, her. Um, questions, we can use the Zoom chat, but since there's only 10 of us, we can just unmute and ask questions. That's great. Um, also, since there's only 10 of us, this is less of an issue. Um, sometimes in bigger groups, one, one voice or one perspective will be really dominate. And there's lots of like, oh yes, plus one, plus one to that. But um, in a smaller group, it's less of an issue. So if, you know, step up and then step back. Uh, one thing I like to add is to the idea to respect the baggage that we're all bringing to any conversation, especially if it's a conversation about money, we all got baggage and we are packing it up and bringing it into every room where we go. So, um, and that means, you know, no one's got bad intentions. We might all, you know, be tired or be sensitive about something. And um, we're trying to keep the communication open and all learn together. And so there's shared notes. I'm gonna click on it and go over there. Oh, nope, it just, it just ended screen sharing, but I'll show you um, where that is by sharing my screen again. Um, okay, so if I could ask you all, I'm going to drop this link in the chat, if you could sign in. So we have, um, where's the chat? Sorry that you're all needing to watch me. Um, ooh, here is the chat. Okay, um, great. Someone else already did it. But if you could go ahead and sign in uh, with your name and your affiliation, um, just so we can all remember who was there, if we want to get in touch with each other later. Um, and then if, does anyone have any other communication norms that have worked really well for you in other settings? It's a dead silence. That's a like, move on, Danielle. We're ready. We're ready to talk. Okay. If anything comes up, we can add it. 
Um, and now I'm going to click back over to here. Whoa. Can you see it again, the slides? Yes, I think. Um, OK, so now I'm going to quickly introduce myself. As I said before, I run Code for Science and Society. We were established in 2016, and we do two things. We're a fiscal sponsor organization. So that means if you have a grant and you don't have an entity, I'm going to help you receive that grant, do the back of house accounting compliance with uh, 501c3 is basically like a US tax designation. So sometimes we're working with people um, who are based in other countries, or we're working with people who don't want to run their own 501c3 because it's a lot of work. Um, and what we do is help them do that so that they can just focus on their work. And we also run community centered programs. So we run an event fund where we give away money. We're helping with the J Ross Rapid Response Awards. I love giving away money. Always looking for ways to give away money. Before that, I was a Mozilla Science Fellow. And before that, I got a PhD in neuroscience and spent nine years at the bench, which is where I got into um, open, open scholarship, open access, open source for science kind of thing. So I would say like what I'm good at is like asking people questions so they can come up with their the, the right decision for them with respect to how to organize a project. Pretty good at uh, stewardship of money, or at least I'm like risk averse. So when things come up, I'm like, oh, let's go talk to the lawyers. Um, and I'm pretty good at like thinking about, okay, we want to give away money and we've got this kind of an organizational infrastructure. Like what can we, how can we use this to do the thing we want to do? Um, and then I'm going to, I brought along Zane, who I met at CSVConf a couple of years ago, and I'm really impressed with his work and um, have always remembered, ah, here's a person who actually is involved in a worker-owned cooperative, which is something that comes up a lot. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to, to bring him into this space. So Zane, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, yeah, so I came to our work from uh, planetary science. I, I didn't used to work on climate, but um, I had also done a lot of um, cooperative development, so food co-ops, housing co-ops, just as like a participant, a member of those cooperatives, so I knew kind of about the organizational model from other contexts. And uh, then a group of us who were working in a small NGO in Colorado had the opportunity to take on a contract <clears throat> that the NGO was not interested in, um, but that we were all interested in. And so because it was a model we were already familiar with and liked, um, we just chose to, to form a, a cooperative to do that work and take that contract. Um, we all started in Boulder, Colorado, but uh, now we've scattered to the winds and it's all remote as is everything this year. Uh, so I'm actually living in Mexico right now. Uh, we Ooh, mostly work- That sounds nice. <laughs> in, it is, it's, it's, it's been, I mean, it's been super lonely, but everywhere I think is super lonely at this point. Um, we work mostly in Python and we take data that is nominally already public and actually clean it up and provide it to kind of civic society users in a analysis ready format. And all of our code is open source under the MIT license and all the data is um, CC by. Um, yeah, so it's it's been working for us so far. Yeah, um, so uh, Zane's work is really awesome. And if you haven't heard of him before, you should definitely look it up. And so now what I'd love to do is, since we have a small group, if uh, folks could introduce themselves. Um, can we start with Juan Pablo? I'm just gonna go by the way you appear on my screen. Sure, uh, Juan Pablo, he, him. I work with the Public Knowledge Project and I've been doing things around open source software for scholarly communications for 13 years. All right. And next I have Raymond. Oh. Hi, my name is Raymond Yuswishin. I am director of um, Texas State University Libraries uh, Digital Services. And um, we've been, I presented earlier today on a digital um, scholarship research ecosystem. And I'm really, and there's been a lot of interest in it uh, nationally and internationally. And I'm really interested in your talk because I know nothing about um, foundation, foundation foundations or the 5013C. And, uh, you know, we're at the university right now and I'm wondering to myself, how can we actually um, take some of the interest in this project that's actually too much on the job and is it possible to start up a nonprofit? So that, that's my interest in uh, 
Yeah, I feel like Juan Pablo might be able to talk a little bit about the tension between being based at a university <laughs> and running a nonprofit, <laughs> but we'll save that for the next slide. Um, I next just I don't see, have the money to quit right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see Sean Bernie on the screen. Sure. Hi, my name is Sean Bernie. Um, I've just finished up on a contract. I was working at Bell Canada in their IT infrastructure architecture department, uh, doing some business analysis and, and some coding work as well, some infrastructure work. Um, prior to that, I was at uh, doing my MBA at Thompson Rivers University. So my wife and I, my wife is a, a Ryerson PhD student studying machine learning and AI, and we are looking to commercialize and uh, and develop open source tools, develop a supply chain for the open educational resources. Um, and so we wanna do this on blockchain. We've done some research and I have no idea how to kind of enter the educational market, um, whether it be through a not-for-profit or non-profit corporation. Do I go for funding? Do I go for private equity? Do I go for venture capital? What do I do, there, right? Oh, so. there is a lot to unpack. There's so <laughs> much there. Um, so let's go on to Evan. Hi, my name is Evan, he, him. I'm a Greek Argentine paleontologist. I, don't know, I do not know how I got here with all of you. I'm, <laughs> I represent a, a publisher from Argentina that we really believe in community-based open access. And we are trying to, to, to scan the world, the landscape of open access and see what kind of tools and what kind of initiatives we could include in our, in our model. Thank you awesome. so much for organizing this. Oh, we have two Argentinians in the room. <laughs> I'm uh, mostly here to listen. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, Kevin, Kevin Hawkins. Hi there, uh, Kevin Hawkins, uh, he, him, University of North Texas Libraries. Uh, I'm currently PI on a project that's seeking to create um, an international community controlled data exchange platform. So. We are, of course, thinking through all these issues on of what sort of structure to set up um, to manage this organization and the infrastructure it's building. Yeah. Um, Chris Shillam? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Um, hi, I'm Chris. Um, I'm about two months into a new role at ORCID as executive director. Um, most of my career, I spent about 25 years in the publishing industry, but involved on the boards of several um, nonprofit infrastructure organizations, Crossref, Orchid, uh, NISA, et cetera. Uh, and this year I've been doing some work before joining Orchid as an independent consultant, um, recommending strategy for infrastructure organizations in scholarly comms. So this topic of um, legal structures, funding models is quite near and dear to my heart. Oh, great. I can't wait to hear your perspective on um, on everyone else's perspective. And then finally, we have Samuel Gray, or Samuel Goy, sorry, mispronouncing. Yeah, it's Samuel Gay. Like, Gay. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Samuel, he, him. Uh, I'm a PhD student who started Open Science in Montreal, which is a student-led initiative. Um, but I'm here mostly to listen and, you know, get to know how these things work because uh, I'm I feel surrounded by important people right now <laughs> you are you too are very important <laughs> um all right well I want to I'm going to start with this slide that I put up uh common models and open scholarship open data open source uh starting with the nonprofit, it, and my expertise is in the states so that's what I know about um in the US, a nonprofit is just a tax designation. Um, I know in the UK, any initiative sort of starts out the same way as a, as a business, and then you make that decision later. In the US, um, you, if you're gonna go into a nonprofit model, it is more straightforward to do that right away. And so we, we run a nonprofit. It sounds like a Catalyst Co-op, when they got a grant from Sloan, they ran it through a nonprofit through a fiscal sponsorship arrangement. Um, fiscal sponsorship is just a term for when you partner with a nonprofit and they're going to administer your funds, which is something that we do. Um, but uh, uh, so Unpaywall, the, the group who's doing the earned revenue, they are a nonprofit. There are many nonprofits that work in the space. Um, Juan Pablo, is PKP a nonprofit? 
Now we've uh, debated whether to become an independent nonprofit. So we are actually just a project within a university. And we, so you're oh. sort of in the next bucket, which is an institutional partnership. There are lots of organizations yeah. in the open science, open data, open scholarship space that are that live at universities. And so the people are employed by the academic institution and they may partner across institutions. Um, Juan Pablo, do you wanna add anything to that? Like how formal is your agreement with the university? Yeah, it, we've been at the university for 15 years now. And actually it looks like next year will be the year where we become an actual entity within the university. So we have had uh, essentially an MOU with the university library that has very loosely said that this is where we are based, but that is the extent to which the, the, our status within the university has been formalized up until now. And we've been looking to try to figure out ways of changing it. And one of the ways we've considered spinning off into a nonprofit independent of the university, and we've considered, and um, we've been trying to find ways of institutionalizing ourselves further within uh, the SFU library. Um, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I could probably leave it there for now, but it, it yeah, it's finding, figuring out what that's supposed to look like and how that's formalized. It has been a process that even 15 years into the relationship with the university, it doesn't necessarily become any clearer uh, yeah. as to what the ideal, <laughs> what the ideal relationship uh, is or should be. Yeah. So moving on to other organizations, this is honestly probably the uh, type of incorporation I know the least about, which is an LLC or another corporation. Oh, good link to PKP uh, in the chat. Now, um, a couple of things I wanna flag, some groups that work in the space, like many of the publishers that we work with, the big academic publishers, those are for-profit entities. There's um, something called Science Direct, which I think one of you mentioned you were looking at scaling and um, taking on venture capital. I think that stuff is fascinating. I know nothing about it. The one thing I do know is that every kind of money comes with its own special strings. And so um, the strings of VC are something we hear a lot about in our world. You know, eventually you need to make uh, money for shareholders and that can be, uh, that can be tricky in our space. And a worker-owned co-op is a type of company. And I, I wonder if Zane could step in and talk a little bit about um, you know, an, an L, an, a limited liability corporation or any corporation can have shareholders who can earn revenue. A nonprofit, we have no shareholders. If, if I, or, or there are no shares, there's no stock. If I quit my job, I walk with nothing, right? I can't, there's no parachute for me. Um, a company can be bought. You can't really buy a nonprofit. Um, a worker-owned co-op is a type of corporate structure, as, as I understand it. And actually, I'm going to stop right there and maybe pass it over to Zane. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that structure. Yeah, sure. I mean, so a worker-owned co-op is a it's a corporation. Um, it has a particular tax treatment under uh, U.S. law. Uh, different states have their own uh, cooperative and corporation statutes, um, some of them. We're incorporated in Colorado because that's where we started. And Colorado also happens to have very flexible um, statutory protections for cooperatives. Um, and we are the shareholders as well. So right now we are, um, there's only four of us who are members. We are the board of directors. We are also the only shareholders. Um, and each person has one share and each share has one vote. Um, so it's, it's really organized around putting the, the employees first as kind of the managers of the organization and the owners of the organization. And we, we chose this model, um, because we prioritized our autonomy very highly. Um, this particular energy data space has a couple of platform monopolies in it that have made a, a habit of buying out all of their competitors and we wanted to avoid that. So we have, you know, first of all, our license seems very open, um, but then we have a poison pill in our um, articles of incorporation that makes it, uh, you know, we're not an attractive purchase, like none of us ooh, would ooh, be able to. Can, can you, can you break that down a little bit? Um, so that's something that I think is really interesting when in the talk uh, before there was some discussion of, um, of locking things open. And it sounds like a poison pill in your articles oper of operation may be a way to lock things open. Is, is that an accurate read? Um, well, it's a way to align our individual incentives with the kind of original mission of the organization. So in the same way that a 501c3 has no equity, you know, you can't be, you can't be bought out in the way that a, a corporation with owners can, um, you know, we arranged for the, the worker owned co-op to 
simulate that to, to some extent. So like we do have shares, we do have um, equity that is the surplus kind of value that we've generated over the last four years, um, which you, you get tax benefits for distributing to the workers. Um, it, it's a pass-through entity in that case, like an LLC where the corporation doesn't pay income tax, but the, the employees do. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It, it has, it's worked well for us. We, we don't answer to a board. We, we answer to ourselves as, you know, former activists who want this work to be done. Um, it, it's also given us the flexibility to work without pay, which may or may not be a kind of flexibility you want. Um, <laughs> but you know, in, in a, in a C3, like suddenly all of the employees aren't getting paid. What do you, you all become volunteers or what? Uh, yeah. We, well, for the record, I've definitely uh, gone on half salary and other models yeah. of reduced salary. Um, yeah. it, it, it can, if, you'd li- if I'd like to work without pay, it can be arranged. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did have one year when we were between a, a contract and finally getting some substantial grant money. And we, we had a little bit of money that we earned over the course of the year and we just paid it out as a dividend at the end of the year. So we didn't really make yeah. a salary, but we had equity and um, were paid that way. So. It's, yeah, yeah. it's a lot of autonomy. It's also a lot of responsibility. You know, we all collectively decide how to run the business um, and that's not always easy. And it's, so but it's something governance, we had experience. Governance with. heavy, sounds like. Yeah. Um, and so it sounds like um, Sean, who's on the call, has maybe worked in a consultancy or a small business. I wonder if you could talk about that, that model. And you mentioned you were looking at other models to take your work forward. Sure. And I'm curious to hear what you're, looking for, looking at. I'm, I'm getting to be uh, involuntarily uh, well-informed in this area because uh, I'm a Canadian corporation. I'm a Canadian citizen. I'm also a U.S. citizen, which now uh, forces me into a very unusual tax situation where I have a foreign-owned um, uh, corporation by an American citizen, right? So I have to do all sorts of weird uh, U.S. accounting rules. So I've arranged it right now. My wife and I are partners on my business. So I own 49% of my business. My wife owns 51% of my of the business. And that avoids the global intangible low taxable income tax, the guilty tax that Trump installed a few years ago, which uh, apart from the filing fees of several thousand dollars here in Canada to adhere to, I usually don't have to pay anything out for it. It's just expensive. So um, I am a corporation. I've been a corporation for 10 years. Uh, I originally started up a startup about 10 years ago and that failed miserably. So I went to the real world and got work and worked through many jobs and I've been moving back to the corporation as a contractor recently. So it's basically just a a corporation. I take on contracts, um, six month, one year contract terms. Now we're looking at doing a a project and uh, moving into the productization of something. And so that's going to change the dynamics of a corporation. And I'm not really sure how that works, right? So I'm looking at various funding models. We do want to build an open source tool for distribution of um, open educational resources that provide provenance and kind of um, force provenance through the very infrastructure of it being a blockchain, a core to blockchain. And so my wife has done a presentation a couple of weeks ago at IEEE on that. So I've talked a lot now, apologies, but um, that's kind of the situation I'm in. We are an infrastructure play. We're a platform. We want to create a market for all sorts of other people to make the whole industry and community sustainable. Um, and we have no idea how we're going to fund it. <laughs> so there you go, in a nutshell. It's, it's, it's relatable. Um, so I wonder if any of the other folks on the call have experience. Oh, so the final model I wanted to mention is just the community steward initiative, stewarded initiative um, that is the model where there is no formal incorporation, there's no bank account, everyone is an independent player who may be working as a consultant, independently working at an academic institution, working at a nonprofit, and coming together to um, work in, you know, in a committee on a project, but it's all kind of volunteer time. There's no bank account. Um, and so I wonder if other, any folks on the call want to speak to their experiences in one or more of these models or any models that I've forgotten that are at, at play or particularly useful. Hi, this is, this is Chris Schillam again. Um, it's interesting because I, I did a, some work earlier in the year trying to come up with a similar taxonomy. And I think you've got a, a couple on here that I didn't come up with. Um, one that 
I've seen a few times is what I've called a, a coalition, which is a, a bunch of organizations that get together to, to work on something in common. And maybe they sign an agreement with each other or at least an MOU. Um, I think that might be similar to your community stewarded initiative, but it's more um, a set of organizations rather than people who work and for- And probably more formalized too, not individuals, yeah. organizations and their MOUs and some understanding of the what each entity's commitment will be, which may or may not exist in a more loose community initiative. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, my reaction to, to this discussion, and, and it's one I've felt for a long time, is whatever you do, there's an awful lot of overhead um, and an awful lot of expertise and money um, and knowledge involved in, in, in running something, which kind of distracts typically from the mission of whatever you're trying to do. Um, so yeah. it would be great, great to find ways to let people do this in a much, get to get together, to get funding, to do administration in a much more lightweight, virtualized way. Yeah. So I, I have a couple of, of thoughts there. You know, one of the things we do is fiscal sponsorship at Code for Science and Society. And we were already doing that when I um, started working at the organization. And I think looking back at the organization when it was young, I probably would not have, now, knowing what I know now, I would have never advised our organization to start doing fiscal sponsorship. We do it now and it's a big part of our business. And I think when you are, looking to work with someone to administer you want to work you want to work with an organization that does that as a main core part of their business because any 501c3 can theoretically receive a grant that's mission aligned but the work of you know the the, the overhead of fiscal sponsorship is is significant and the overhead of starting up your own 501c3 also significant and costly um, so today in our space i think a lot of folks uh, are so there's a couple of fiscal sponsors that I think are doing really great work. Um, Aspiration Tech works in, I think they work with COCO and other um, open source for scholarship, open source for good platforms. Um, there's also Open Collective, which some of you may have heard of. Um, open Collective uh, is really interesting because they can really, they can set you up with a bank account uh, and a tax ID really quickly to receive individual donations. And they have this transparent accounting platform, which allows people to see money coming in and then you invoice against it and money going out. And I can put these notes, these uh, links in the chat, but some, you know, every, there are many ways, there's always someone who will help you receive a grant or donation. Um, they're just, you know, what do you need and what can, the different entity provide to you. I guess it's like a funder uh, or any kind of funding has strings, any kind of fiscal sponsorship or incorporation relationship or structure also has its own strings. Um, I wonder if anyone wants to comment a little bit on what has or hasn't worked more like, I mean, I know this is being recorded and like talking about failure is like not that fun. But um, I'm, you know, I, I think we, we did not know as much about fiscal sponsorship when I first started as we do now, right? And we, we've learned a lot along the way and I think we've become a lot more valuable to the projects that work with us as we've grown. Um, institutional partnerships, similarly, like that can be a way to hang out for a while, but I wonder Juan Pablo, if you could talk about like ways in which that's worked in terms of like helping you get the work done and and ways in which it maybe like added overhead or gotten in the way of getting the work done. Yeah, I mean, the, the benefits for us of being essentially, you know, we're a research project at a university, even though we operate and all of our activities take on something that looks very much like a nonprofit and independent organization. In practice, we're a project at a, a university, which means that on the, on the positive side, we end up getting all of the infrastructure and things that a university puts in place. So, you know, there's mechanisms for the, you know, we rely on research accounting and on accounting to be able to provide, to do reporting, financial reporting out of grants, to issue invoices, to issue checks. We have a legal department that we can turn to if we need to ask questions. Like there, there's a bunch of things that the university just provides to anybody that is operating from within the institution. And that sometimes is really great because we don't have to invest in it. Um, on the 
you know, but on the other side, we sometimes, you know, it's a huge institution What for what has at times, right now PKP has grown quite a bit, but at times there was, you know, five people working and having this whole university infrastructure to essentially be managing a small project meant sometimes there's just like a huge overkill for things that we needed. And so the amount of bureaucracy to be able to make a contract with someone for $5,000 or $6,000 required going through procurement services and bureaucracies that are established to do something that if we were a small organization, you would essentially write a statement of work in the back of a napkin and say, here's an invoice for it and you'd be done. Um, and so there, it, it, it forces you to you have to rely on all of those procedures. So. Um, we, like I said, we've settled on this being a good arrangement for us now, especially as we've grown, but there was, there's definitely been times when trying to move and do things within the university, and we still continue to bang our heads against the bureaucracies um, uh, a lot of the time, uh, and it's just, that's a cost for us, that, and we hope that the benefits that we get from the institution outweigh those costs. So you brought up something interesting around operations. And so, and, and Chris brought this up in his comment, the idea that you can really bury yourself under um, operations because you, well, I, I can only speak for myself. I certainly do not have the financial expertise to do everything that we need to do for our organization. I hire people who do, but even you know working with them and running it, it it's a lot of work. So I wonder if Zane and other folks can talk about how they've handled operations and compliance. And do you feel like that is, um, you know, you're, you're operating on the right scale or do you feel like sometimes it's overwhelming and too much? Um, well, I can, we've, we've used a lot of online services that have kind of like a per seat cost. So we use a project called Harvest to do all of our, our time tracking and invoicing. Um, you know, obviously the, the GitHub services. And there's really, it's, it's become like quite an ecosystem, e ecosystem of a la carte kind of business services. So Gusto for doing payroll. Um, we have a retirement account set up with Vanguard through their small business plan. Um, we're doing healthcare now through the, the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Um, so it, it, it's been a lot of like different things to cobble together, but it, it feels like it's mostly working okay right now. We have one person that does kind of back office stuff, maybe, you know, between five and 10 hours total a week. Yeah, we also use services. So we, we have a big HR, man, HR solutions company that handles the benefits for our employees, both in our core team and at our projects. And we're paying per paycheck for that, but I think it's uh, worth it in because when I need to hire someone for a sponsored project as a full-time employee, I can just do that and know that I have the resources that the um, you know the particulars of hiring a person in the state of Massachusetts, for example, are not going to become hugely my problem. They're a little bit my problem, but. Uh, I have experts and other people working on that because that that kind of stuff in the states, which is where I operate, um, uh, state by state compliance is a is a rich tapestry. Um, so while we were chatting, I kind of switched the slide um, because the the questions that I like to frame to people when they're trying to make their decision are you know a little bit around mapping out what do you need today in terms of people and that's so staffing and what do those people need? Sometimes you can start something with independent contractors but you'll start to lose talent or you can work with students but then those students are gonna want full-time jobs. Um, what do you need today in terms of funding? Where's it gonna come from? Uh, is it contracts? Um, and now I know Sean, you mentioned working as a contractor. I do know a lot of people who work in our space at doing contract work on larger grants. So a larger grant might come into an institution. And if there is a piece of that that an independent contractor needs to do, they, there can be an arrangement with the university and they don't need to be their own 501c3. Um, so if it's, but if you're gonna be the one to receive a big grant, you really need a partner who has a 501c3 or you need uh, to be one yourself because and even then you may need like extra layers of vetting to like really get it through. And then the big one for me, the big ones for me beyond those two are operations and governance. Um, you can be all set up to receive funding with a bank account, but oh boy, just like, you know, making sure all of your accounting is done to best practices and um, handling, you know, the growth, 
you really want to be, I, I had a really smart person, um, the operations director at Access Now uh, made this comment to me that you always want your operations to be when possible, like ahead, leapfrogging ahead of your programs so that, you know, normally, and I think this is the world most of us inhabit operations is like running behind playing catch up with programs to try to make, make the make real what programs has dreamed up and operations is like, okay, we're going to make, we're going to make a grant making program now. How are we going to do this? And so trying to get operations leapfrogged ahead so that you can um, be more effective in your programs. I really liked that framing. And then governance. Um, and I think that's one of the interesting things for me about the worker owned cooperative model, you know, a nonprofit model where there's no equity, no shares, it's not the right model for everyone. Um, and it's not necessarily the only way to do good in the world. And so I think a worker owned co-op model or B Corp models, there are lots of other interesting things that I don't know a lot about uh, that come with their own governance re requirements. Um, but the, you know, the main thing that I want to ask people when I'm talking to them about what they want to do, it's like, what are you, what do you want to do with your time over the next six months? What are the things you're good at? What is the management time that you're anticipating? If you're going to start a 501c3, is it reasonable for you to build the skills that that's gonna be required? If you're gonna start an LLC, what are the skills that you'll need to build to do that? Is that a reasonable use of your time? And a lot of it, um, when I think people are trying to make the decision, comes back to taking a hard look at like, if, I'm, if I wanna spend my time you know, doing software development or, or running a, a community facing program, I may, there may be like no time left for me to do some of these other things that would be required. So then maybe I'm better off, you know, partnering with an institution to receive the grant or maybe, and, and putting um, a 501c3 incorporation on a longer term roadmap. And then finally, like, where do you wanna be and what do you think you're need, gonna need to get there? So I like to have people sort of map it out. Like, here's what we need today. Here's how I wanna spend my time for the next six months. And then here's what I think we're gonna to need tomorrow. And, and hopefully those things align. So I'm wondering um, for the other folks on the call, when you think about um, you know, the kind of operation that you're running, um, do these questions resonate with you? How, how do you advise people when they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do? Or, or, or what questions do you have about what you wanna do? Uh, this is this is Chris again. I'll, I'll have a go. I think a lot of this is about scale. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the difficulty is just navigating the world and knowing knowing what the options are um, and the criteria. I mean, I think I mentioned I used to work for a big publisher. I spent most of this year as an independent consultant. Um, and what I did was set up an LLC. And that turned out to be really simple. But I didn't know it was simple when I was trying to figure out what to do. Right. So finding out the the you know the resources to navigate the world and figuring out what your options are i think is one of the challenges um uh, but i think to, to to my point you know if i look at now working for orchid that's a 501c3 um that's about 35 people uh now and i think at that scale that kind of structure makes sense it's an independent organization um, it, it can afford, we can afford to hire the people it takes to run that organization. But I think if you're much smaller than that, um, then there's so much overhead involved in a, in a 501c3, you'd just spend all of your time doing that. And again, it's, you know, how, how do you figure that out? Yeah. Where can you get advice about what the options are? So one of my board members um, just gave me some free advice on that, um, which I'll pass on to you all. His, his take was you know, once you have about two to 3 million in revenue per year, you probably need your own organization. So yeah. whether that's, whether you're, and you know, that may not be one size fits all, but that's when it starts to make sense in terms of your general operating costs to be able to have, even as Zane is saying, like having that one person who's dedicated to back office stuff most of the projects that Code for Science and Society works with, and you know, this num these numbers are all on our 990s and stuff, so you can look them up. But most of our projects range between uh, 200k a year and 750k a year in in their operating budgets. And at that scale, especially at the lower end, 
it would be um, a lot for one of those projects that has a $200,000 budget to, um, to spend some of that on operations instead of just spending a flat percentage. Um, okay, we're getting a message. That the breakout room is closing. Um, this has been a really enjoyable discussion for me. I hope it has been for you too. Thank you. Thanks for arranging. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much Zane for, for joining us and talking about your project um, and your the model that you've used. And if anyone ever wants to chat about this stuff, I am more than happy to I'll always take a call to talk about um, decision-making around um, models, fiscal sponsorship, uh, funding, all that stuff. Um, and if you're interested so, in co-ops, feel free to, to reach out in particular to us. Thanks so much.